Also respect the fact that his commitment to family, his, his commitment to his faith, all things that are really important to us, that, that really brought us together in so many different ways. And um, some of my most memorable times when I've been around his family, I've been, I've been to worship with him. Um, when I see him on the floor and he represents what we should have be represented in the game of basketball. So when, when James made arguably one of the most important calls in, the, in uh, March Madness last year and did the right thing for the right reason and had the will to do that, no surprise. That would, be my, that would be my expectation because of what he's made of, okay? So, I mean, if we were to take the top officials in the, in the, in the game throughout the country, and, and his capabilities is that he could be working in June you know, as well as in March. That's, that's how good he is. Uh, tremendous understanding of the game, his skills with people, his management of the game, his strength, all those things. So when I, we say models, this is a model to look at. And if you notice, we've used him on, on our video quite often. And remember also we did an interview with him early in the year. And we don't take any of that lightly. That's important to us. Okay? So um, you got the floor. Thanks for coming down from Louisville. Thank you, Ed. I don't need that, right? Cause no, I'm, Mike. I'm Mike. Okay. Mike, yeah. Okay. So first of all, thank you. That was far more probably rewarding than, than deserved. But I will tell you just a little background. Um, met Ed about 20 years ago when they first started the D-League. Uh, Ed was in charge, brought me in. And just to give you a little insight in what you're doing, first of all, I will tell you, he's the single greatest teacher of officiating I've ever been around. Um, I've been in bad hotels at 3.30 in the morning breaking down videotape with him when he was in charge of the entire NBA. But that was how much he cared about the development program, the younger officials, and helping us get better. We literally have had times in the D-League where we would go from um, breaking down video to packing our bags and going to get on a flight because Ed kept us up all night. And it was unbelievable knowledge. Um, when I got selected to the Final Four, I made one phone call, Ed Rush. Um, I would have made one more to John Guthrie, but he passed away. So that's how much I think of Ed. I think your all's opportunity and what he provides with Court Club in here. Um, Shelly and I were talking about this. There's very minimal teaching that goes on across the country for college basketball officials. Um, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of $600 tryout camps and a lot of $600 show up and ref bad basketball camps. So one, congratulations for you guys for being here. Uh, you've made a great decision. Um, I hope what I give you is as good as what Chris gives you and good as what Ed gives you. So, um, to basketball. I think basketball is the hardest sport in the world to referee. And here's why. The spontaneity of, spontaneity of our decision making is unparalleled. The only thing that equates to having to make the split second decisions we make is calling balls and strikes in baseball. And guess what they just started in baseball? Electronic ball and strike calling. So. You know, if you think about a football guy, process a play, see what happens, throw a flag. Uh, soccer, the other sports where you've got a little bit of time frame, but we have tenths of a second when a play occurs to make a decision. Even a super patient whistle is going to take place in what, maybe three-fourths of a second? And the good news is because our game is so varied and ten super athletic people are in a really small space, they can never put enough robots and cameras out there, so we're always going to have a job. So I like the job security of it, but it's not easy. So what I want to talk about today is really not, you know, Chris talked a great job, one of the most cerebral, smart guys you'll be around. So listen to everything he tells you. Um, what I want to talk about is less about actual play calling and more about mentally preparing yourself to make the right call. So if you think about play calling and its basic fundamentals, the things you all have heard over and over and over, because I know the training you're getting is, one, getting yourself into position. Two, knowing what to look for when you're in position. And then three, giving yourself the ability and the time to process the play, play properly and make a good decision. Okay? If you can do those things, you know, most of us are going to get in the right spot. Most of us know to referee the defender. And we have some awareness of what could happen on the play to make a good decision. So then the next level of that is a greater understanding of what goes into that decision and preparing yourself mentally through play recall, understanding of the game, and just a basic principle of I'm mentally prepared to make that call when it comes to me, regardless of whether it's 19 minutes 
left in a game in November or whether it's two seconds left in a game in March. So those fundamentals and principles are the same. Women's basketball, men's basketball, NBA, FIBA, college basketball plays, basketball plays, mental preparation, being mentally aware of situations that can happen and how you're going to react to those situations. It transcends all levels. Doesn't matter where you are, men, women. I refereed in the WNBA, refereed in the D-League, refereed every level of college basketball, refereed high school basketball. The fundamentals that Ed teaches you and the things that we're going to talk about, it doesn't matter where you are. So don't feel like this is a men's basketball discussion. This is a, a general referee discussion that I think everybody will benefit for. So um, just to, as far as this goes, I know they need mics. I love questions. I love interactions. I, I, I want input. Um, I would rather not just vomit a bunch of information to you and then you walk away and be like, man, I wish I'd ask him that. So if you do, just give me a second, hold your hand up real quick, um, and I'll run the mic to you. Otherwise, I'd tell you just yell at me, but they want you to use the mic. So let, let's go with that. But please, encourage interaction. Um, I don't want to use that play first. Um, go to the... Um, Go to the Duke play. No, no, no. Back to the drop box. So the first play we're going to look at while he pulls it up is um, it's a play at the end of the Duke game in the NCAA tournament. Uh, three really good referees on the play. And I don't want to argue foul, no foul, push, no push. Um, let's talk more about what goes into the thought process around this sequence because it's a lot. And there's a lot to it. So UCF, Duke, end of game. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. And if you don't mind, I'll tell you when to pause. All right, stop right there. Okay, so let's just set up the situation. Let, let's, let's get into the minds of the referees on the floor, in the positions they're in, in the situations they're in. So we've got UCF getting ready to take out the number two overall seed in the tournament, number one seed in that region. 21.5 seconds left. You know, we're in pretty good starting position. Uh, high ball screen, which if you're referring any men's college basketball, you see the high ball screen on about half the plays. So you better know how to referee that play. That's another thing, backing up the beginning. When you see everybody running a high ball screen or three-fourths of the teams I referee who run down and yell horns and they put a guy at each elbow and run off one ball screen or the other, know that. If you're seeing that play 30 times a game, learn how to referee that play. Because I'm just telling you, for me, nothing helps me with play calling more than play recall. I've seen the play over and over. I've seen the play over and over. It's not going to dictate specifically how I call that play, but I'm going to know what can result from that play activity. So in this, you've got a high ball screen. Duke down three. Let's be honest. Who's Duke probably throwing the ball to? Zion or RJ. So you've got to know where those guys are. Okay. So go ahead and run the play. Stop right there. Okay, so they get what they want. They got Zion isolated on the wing. Zion a three-point shooter? Absolutely not. So first thing, pretty good possession, position adjustment by Paul. Gets down. Remember, going to try to primarily, especially these game situations, referee in the defense. You always want to be able to see through the play, see the front of the defender's jersey. If you're ever looking at the back of the defender, move. There's no magic spot to move to. Okay. You could say up, you could say down, but he wants to go down on this play because if he goes up, he's going to be looking at the back of Zion's jersey. So we're in pretty good position, and I'm speaking for Paul here. I don't, haven't talked to him about the play, but if I'm Paul, I'm thinking he probably ain't shooting a three. Okay? Probability is he's going to go to the rack. So if I'm Brian at lead, what am I thinking? All right. Does anybody know anything about the guy in the middle of the lane? He's big. <laughs> He's the biggest human I've ever been around in my life. <laughs> I refereed me in the NIT. We walked out. I was the referee on the game. And the first thing I did was said, you're tossing. Because that dude is enormous. I was not about to get in there and let him elbow smash me with his 7-7 or whatever it is frame. He did you see he blew away every measurement at the NBA Combine for length and height. So, so this is a pretty basic thought process. Most powerful guy in college basketball, but he loves to drive, loves to, drive to the hole, and he shoots about 20% from the three-point line. Biggest guy in college basketball, not super mobile. So, got to be thinking, attempt to block a shot. You're not going to take a charge in that. Got to get him out of the RA. 
Paul's got to take him all the way to the basket. Lee's got to take this guy. In their mind, they've got to be thinking, okay, we got 18 seconds left. We need a good foul. We need a solid foul. But we don't want to make something up. So we're going to referee this play on its merits, okay? But we know what the situation is. Go ahead and run the play and let's let it go for a minute. Okay, stop. You think this game isn't hard. Let's just talk about the number of decisions. Stop right there. Uh, when you get it to Zion with the ball again. All right. So first of all, they're all over us in college basketball about traveling. I'll be honest with you. You're not going to be the greatest referee in the world by being the single greatest traveling referee ever. Okay? So referee the defense with awareness of the offense, but don't hang your hat on somebody scissor stepped an eighth of an inch and take the ball away from a team down three on a marginal travel, which we don't do. That's just food for thought. So the second thing, Paul's got the primary defender. Zion's going to initiate contacts. He's a 280-pound tank. He's got a 48-inch vertical leap, and he does. So decision one is call or no call on the first play on the initial drive with the primary defender. Okay, We, we pass on that. Now we've got the contact in the paint with, with Taco. So go ahead. Pass, patient whistle, okay, stop. So my point is here, you could argue the first foul is an offensive foul, is that I increase contact or not. Not my job, I'm not there, it's a tough situation. You could argue Taco's legal or he's not, is he grounded in the RA, is he ever two feet facing? I don't know, maybe he is, maybe he's not. Tough decision. If you ask me, just opinion, I think this is a foul, but the, 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 the point of the discussion is not the decision on foul or not. It's what are we doing to get to where we make an educated play, an educated call on this play. We end up with a whistle from slot on this play. I think ideally, if you think it's a foul, your best look on the secondary defenders from Lee. Okay? What else in this play are we probably thinking in a drive to the basket with a team down three? Kick out. Okay? But... We don't exactly have Magic Johnson with the ball. He kind of got a one-track mind. <laughs> um, so the other thing I would tell you is, and I don't want to get too deep in the woods on this, is when they're down three and he's two feet from the basket shooting a two-point basket and you've got a play that clicks your trigger as I think that's a foul, don't be too pure. Okay? Don't be too pure. I think this is a foul. Uh, I think Paul does a good job when Brian doesn't blow. His whistle cadence is actually pretty good. It's a hair late if you had audio. And uh, it, it's, it, it, we get a play. Anything else on this play from a thought process wise before I give you a couple other things? Okay. So, and actually, I'm going to save that for the next play. Go to the next play. Go to the um, Auburn, Florida. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hold on. So, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, don't get mad at me if I don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so on this one, since really that's the only thing going on, yep. what is Trail's thought process? Obviously, he wants to be involved, not like just blow for the heck of blowing, but like there's not really anything happening. We know what's going on. So what is what's Trail thinking? Well, with, with Taco in there, one, basket, inter goal fit, basket interference and goaltending is an issue. Two, he's going to position adjust when he sees Zion catch the ball and get about a step below 28-foot mark, maybe a step out on the floor, because he does us no good at midcourt. And it's really just got to be – I think the fundamentals of successful refereeing are really simple. You referee the defense, you trust your partners, you stay in your primary, and you call the obvious. I've heard that – 23 years ago in my first camp with John Guthrie, I still think they're the four most important things in refereeing basketball. Um, but the stay in your primary part at the end of games, if there's a foul that you absolutely know has to be called and you're 100% sure, there's one play, one ball, two defenders, somebody has to get that play if we are sure it's a foul and we need to come get it. Okay, so. 99.9% .9 of the time, stay in your primary. Stay in your primary. If you think about it from a mindset perspective, if three guys referee their primary and they're super aggressive and get every play right in their primary, how good are we? Tremendous. When we have to come out of our primary and take plays on marginal contact, the, ooh, that might be a foul, out of my primary, not a foul. 
the play out of my primary, I'm 100% sure that's a foul. We need that whistle. That helps the crew. Marginal contact in your secondary is not a foul. Just put that in your mind. Marginal contact in your secondary is not a foul. Okay? I, for my first 10 years in the Big East, I refereed about a three-by-three three triangle in front of myself because I wasn't blowing in front of Burr, Higgins, and Otto, and Cal. One, Burr would have yelled at me and probably strangled me in the locker room, and two, I'd have never survived. So I'm just telling you, early in your career, be the best referee you can be in your primary, and when the ball's alive, do your one-third. Mark Wunderlich told me a long time ago, crew chiefing all takes place when the ball's dead. Crew chiefing always takes place when the ball's dead. Because most of the situations where you got to step up, know a rule, throw somebody out, deal with unsportsmanlike conduct, 90% of the time happens when the ball's dead. So if three guys can referee as strong as they humanly possibly can and be 100% in their primary, and then one guy is an awesome, does an awesome job being the crew chief when the ball's dead, you're going to have a really good game. And you're going to have a really good relationship with your partners. So um, let's move on to this play, because there's a lot. No, what? Hold on, Mike. Move Matt up, James. Okay. Nice to meet you. So just speaking about what he was saying, um, we came out and found that our worst play caller, or our, our um, in the NBA, our play calling stats. So our secondary play caller that's the best in the NBA is coming out in his secondary blowing calls. There's a far, there's a huge gap between him and our worst play caller and their primary. So speaking about that, our best play caller, our worst play caller in the primary, there's a huge gap between them and our best play caller and their secondary. Does that make sense? No? So in the NBA, we came out and found that in our secondary, our best play caller, there's a huge gap between them and our worst play caller in their primary. Huge gap down? Down, yes. Okay. Yes, they, their percentages were. So that's pretty much what they're saying. Yeah, don't come out your primary. If you're our best secondary caller, you're still going to be way worse than our worst caller. I've watched, I, I'm, a, I'm a tape geek, I'm a play geek. Um, I watch all my games, I cut play after play after play. I will tell you, when I miss plays, it's because I'm either blowing out of my primary or something surprised me. If I can get myself in position, find the right guy to referee, I'm pretty good. I decide I want to go get something that I'm not sure on, I'm not very good. Um, so it's just food for thought. In camp, I think there are things in camp you can do that really help you as a camp referee, whether this camp or somewhere else in camp. I think the best thing you can do in camp is be the best referee you can possibly be in your primary and win one of those situations, step up to where you can be the guy that comes out of the bottom of the funnel of 60 referees. Those situations are, do you know the rule? Is there unsportsmanlike conduct that needs to, needs to be dealt with? Is the clock messed up and can you fix it? When those situations arise, and think about what I just said, all three dead ball situations, that's when you show you're the crew chief. You don't show you're the crew chief by blowing in front of your partner because you think you're better than he is. That's bad crew dynamics, and you're going to get plays wrong. I, I've seen it. I've done it. Ed and I had a great discussion one time about, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. Ed told me you can't always play God in the referee business. I had this, my personality is that I want things to be right. I don't like it when the game's messed up, whether it's my fault or not. So I got into a situation a couple years into the D-League where I was a little more experienced, crew chiefing, crew chiefing some D-League games, and I started blowing out of my primary. I started, you know, honestly making some really poor decisions because I wanted the game to be right. And it was wrong. I made it worse. So thank God, a good mentor said to me, hey, can't do that. You can't always play God. You can't always fix it. You can't always... Somebody misses a play and you think, man, we got to get that back. That's not fair to that team. You can't come go get another play just to make it right. Okay? There's a difference in knowing the game, being consistent and understanding the game, playing God and manipulating, I'll steal Shelley's term here, manipulating the situation. Can't do that. Okay? All right, let's go. 
No, no, I like it when other people talk. Um, and we also have to think about when we come out of our primary how that makes our partner feel, right? So when we come out of our primary, it has a tendency to speed up the whistle of the partner who it is that you're blowing in front of. And I know this may not always be the case, but when we come out of, of our primary in a gray area play, what we're telling our partners is that our judgment is better than theirs, right? And I know that's not the case, but these are just things that we need to be thinking about, right? Because it's more than just black and white, right? So just something to think about. That's great to block Yeah. Well, and to add to what she said, and I think this is a really important point, is um, if your first whistle of a game is a play out of your primary in front of a partner, what do you think the credibility of your partner that you just blew in front of with the two coaches is? What do you think he's doing the next five minutes? God, am I already missing stuff? What do I do now? You know, Ed and I were talking earlier on the way over here about um, – my first or second year in the SEC, John Guthrie pulled me aside after I'd screwed up a game and said, listen, I know you can get plays right. What I want to know is what do you do for the next five minutes after you've totally screwed one up? You know, it's that can you reset? Can you recover? Um, and I think that's, that's a sports and a life thing, not just a referee thing. They're all going to make mistakes. I mean, I've made mistakes parenting my 13-year-old daughter on a daily basis. But then I have to figure out the next day how am I going to make it better and be a better parent. And in refereeing, I, I don't care who you are. You know, Ed Rush, one of the greatest NBA referees ever. Doug Sermon's one of the best NCAA officials. Close friend of mine, John Goble, I think is as good as anybody in the NBA. They all miss plays. It's not do they miss plays. It's what happens the next five minutes after they miss them. Hit the reset button, get your next three right. Or you're thinking, holy cow, they're still showing it on the Jumbotron. Somebody's still yelling at me, and I'm totally screwed up, and you missed three more. That's the difference in good and great. Great is missed it, move on, next three right. Good is uh, still second-guessing myself, got to get through this, and you're 50%, and then not making it is you're in the tank for 10 minutes. So just if you can get that mindset of, hey, not going to be perfect, but I'm going to be better next time. Okay? Uh, Interesting situation here. So before we even run to play, 65-62, 6.2 seconds left, SEC tournament. My first thought here, if I'm on the court, has to do with time and score. So I want somebody to give me the mic and tell me if you're one of the officials on the floor before this second of two free throws goes up. Does this one not work? Oh. Got to be careful what I say, don't I? Um, if, uh, if I'm one of the officials on the floor and I'm shooting a free throw at 65-62 and it's the second of two, somebody tell me what your thought process is. He's going to miss on purpose. The shooter is going to miss on purpose to try to get the rebound. They're up. Auburn's white. They're up. Okay. You want to reset? Okay. If, if, if Auburn is the team in white, then they're going to try to take a shot, maybe foul to prevent the three after the ball is inbounded, play some sort of pressure defense. Yep. Now gotta we're get, talking. Now we're getting yourself we aware for possible press cover. Yep. So my thought process is, hey, if he makes it, we got a four-point <gasps> game. They're going to do everything they can not to foul anybody because you can't beat me on a four-point shot. If he misses it, he's exactly right. We've got to be thinking, are they going to take a foul? Okay? And your thought process isn't, I'm going to make a foul up if I think they're taking a foul. My thought process is, I have to be aware that they could take a foul. College basketball teams are notoriously terrible at giving away take fouls. NBA teams have mastered take fouls. College basketball teams, they wait too long. They let them cross the line. They're almost in the shooting motion. They make our decisions incredibly difficult. Okay, but that's why you have to be mentally prepared before he shoots this second free throw of what's going to happen, and stop, not what's going to happen, what could happen. Okay, so let's see what happens. Yep. Actually, stop one second. Let's flip it. What's the offense has to, has to be thinking? Well, six seconds left. They're probably not going to go hard to the hole. 
they need a three. They've also got two of the best three-point shooters in the SEC. So defense, a lot of options. Offense, probably going to try to get the three-point line. Yep, good, good point. All right, so let's go. So now we're up, we're, we're up three. Got to get to the three-point line. Ooh. Okay. Let's not argue the merits of does the take foul come first? Is he in the shooting motion? Again, very difficult play. If you watch Harper, the kid in the headband for Auburn, he approaches him like he's going to take the take foul. Okay? And then he's kind of like, oh, do I want to take this take foul? And then by the time I think he does foul him, we're into the really, really tough decision of take foul before upward motion or shooting foul. I'm not even going to argue which one it is. You probably throw your hands up and be 50-50. It's irrelevant. The thought process is very relevant because it will help you make a much better decision, again, not assume what's going to happen, but it will make you make a much better decision on what actually does happen if your mindset coming down the floor is Auburn may take a foul before he gets to shooting motion. Auburn may take a foul before he gets to shooting motion. If the trail's on the play and he's got to make this decision, what can the center be doing and thinking? Yeah, shooting motion. Okay, Not just the foul, but shooting motion. Um, this is a two-person refereeing play with multiple decisions, and we've got to be in a mindset of having an awareness of what could happen and then applying what does happen to get this play right. Very, very tough decision on whether he's in the shooting motion or not, but we can help our crew, and again, we've got the whole crew working here to make this decision if we work together and we've all been on the same page thinking what could happen on the play.